you've seen today's guest on his TV shows, Apex Predator and Solo Hunters, or maybe you saw him on the Netflix original Meat Eater. Regardless of where you last saw Remy Warren, he gets a serious resume upgrade by today being on Gearbox Talk. Okay, so I'm still awaiting a call from my agent about the Netflix deal, and if we're honest here, I think Remy may be classing up our, our show here, a little bit of Gearbox Talk. But, but, I'm excited to have Remy on all the same. We're talking all things elk. Remy's going to give insights into the most common mistakes that people make when elk hunting with guides, what broadheads he recommends. He's going to show us his own bow hunting setup. He's going to talk about how to improve your success rate and your tracking and much more. I respect the heck out of Remy Warren as a writer, as a businessman, as a hunter, and I'm proud to release this show with him and shed some light on some of his hunting tactics and his gear. Remember, all of the gear and websites that are mentioned on the show are linked to in the show notes. If you buy something through our links, we probably make money. If we make money, we donate a portion of our proceeds to Raise My Doors. Those donations help first-time hunters, that's kids and their parents, learn how to hunt, fish, shoot, and camp. So go on, buy it for the kids. Think of the children. All right, let's do this. This is Gearbox Talk with Remy Warren. You're all set up and ready to talk on Gearbox Talk. How's it going, man? Pretty good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. And we just did another Restless Native show. So if anybody hasn't checked out, checked out Restless Native, you got to go and subscribe to that so you can see another episode with Remy. But for today, it's all about the elk. We're going to dive right in, man. You're an elk hunting guy. You, you see tons of new people coming in. And I am curious, what is one of the biggest mistakes that people come, uh, when people come in to, to hunt with you, what's one of the biggest uh, mistakes that people make with elk hunting? I think overwhelmingly probably the biggest mistake is just not being physically prepared enough. So not necessarily anticipating how much physical exertion is going to be needed and then just not going that extra mile to be physically prepared. Um, and then along that same vein, I would say the the next biggest mistake could just be not shooting enough or not practicing enough with whatever they're hunting with, whether it be a rifle, a bow, whatever, just being ready because you're going to work really hard. And when you get to that point, you're going to want to be able to make a good shot. So those two things are definitely at the top of the list. Excellent answer. Uh, this may be, maybe this is the same answer, but I'm kind of curious, you know, you and I on our other show, we talked about how turkey hunters think that turkey hunting is like elk hunting until they go elk hunting. But looking back on all your other hunts, what's a common surprise kind of like that, that, that people have when they first go elk hunting, their first elk hunt, you know, what's something that they weren't expecting? I think that um, probably the thing they aren't expecting is, you know, you see all these videos of people calling an elk for years and it's just like, they bugle and then the elk comes in and they don't see what it takes to get to that point for the elk to come in. So I'll be guiding a guy and I'm like, we're bow hunting and we're calling and the elk calls. And then it's like, okay, now we have to run. And they're like, why are we running? Cause we have to get to this. We have to get as close as possible. And then we have to do this and do that. And then it's like, when the elk comes in, it's like, that's that magic moment. But there's a lot of stuff before that magic moment that never gets shown to people. And so that's not in their mind. And I, I try to make it my personal mission to say, yeah, when that elk, when you call that elk in, there's a lot of stuff that happened before that um, that needs to go right, and oftentimes has a certain physical capability that you need to get to that point to call that elk to your location. So yeah. I think that that is just not really thought about, or is like, whoa, I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to run. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think I, I can't remember. I think the elk success rate is like ten percent, right? It's it's pretty low. Uh, because there's a lot of challenges. It, it's a tough hunt. What what tips do you give to just beginner elk hunters in general to increase that success rate and to get above the average? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just understanding elk behavior is key. And if you're new to it, um, really just kind of keying in and, and just researching as much as you can on how elk act, how elk do what they want to do. The more you understand elk behavior, the way that they feed, their types of patterns, the more successful you're going to be in the long run. And it's really, honestly, it's, I would say there's a certain percentage of people that are successful on hunting elk every year. And those are the people that really understand elk behavior. You can go anywhere and just understand what elk like to do and realize that elk are not necessarily like other things. I think that's a, as you mentioned, a common misconception. And if you go in with that mindset, you're probably setting yourself the bar a little too low. You need to understand elk as elk. And once you do that and kind of dive into that kind of research, you're going to be a lot better off. 
you know, I had Ben O'Brien on my podcast years ago, and he was talking about a hunt you guys did in Hawaii, I think. And I, I somehow you came up, you came up. I was asking him about like who had the, one of the better hunts of the trip, and, and he brought up your name. And I said, "What makes Remy so good? What 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 is it that gets him to that success?" And he said it was his understanding of the animals. Like you just have this great perception, and the, it, I think he called out the ability to close distance. Um, when w- part of that though, part of part of your abilities is is that tracking your ability to find animals. When you're tracking elk and looking for sign, what what are some things that a newbie should look for? What are you looking for when when you're hitting a new territory? Yeah, when I'm hitting a new spot, I mean, first I look. I mean. It's been said many times, and it's, it's nothing new, but food, water, cover. And I generally focus on the food aspect for elk. Um, with elk especially, I think one skill that you really need to have is glassing ability. So if you're going out on your own, being able to find the animals. You can't stalk an animal. Spot and stalk starts with spot. So you need to be able to look over an area and effectively look over an area. And then also kind of decipher through, I think, a lot of e-scouting and map action where the elk will like to be so preferred habitat um finding that food water cover and then going in there and saying okay are there actually elk here what's some signs that they're elk here tracks uh you know rubs or scrapes other things um, and then even just elk themselves and so once you find those things then you can start to key in on what's what is about this spot where the elk actually are that why are they here and then find other places like that. And that's how you're really going to be successful is just figuring out where the elk are, where you're hunting, and then kind of what makes that spot special and how are there other spots around that are very similar to that spot. Yeah, it's really good advice. All right, man, we're going to dive into some gear. Broadheads, I love talking about broadheads because people will argue until the end of time on what the right broadhead is for an animal. I want to talk a little bit about this uh, for your elk hunts. What what broadheads and maybe arrow setup in general are, are you using for your personal hunts? Yeah, so I mean, I've got one right here. I've got the Montec M3s. Um, it's just a solid fixed blade broadhead. That's what I like for elk. Uh, elk are big animals; they're tough animals, and if you hit it in the shoulder, you want or you, you generally want to try to stay away from the shoulder. But you want to make sure that you get good penetration. And so I use a little bit heavier arrow. Um, this one right here is 11.2 grains per inch. I shoot a fairly long arrow. It's uh, almost. It's not full length. It's about 30 inches. And then um, I actually, it's got a little bit of a weighted uh, outsert collar here. Uh, Day six, this is a 300 spine arrow. Um, It's the Day six HD. And I like these. They're super tough. Like they're pretty hard to break. They're micro diameter, so it bucks the wind a little bit. Um, But also just so strong, the way that they're wrapped and the way that the carbon lays. They're really dense as well. So um, they're just really strong for big animals. Elk are big animals. They're tough animals. Do you want to make sure that the arrow gets to the vitals and you make a quick, clean kill? So I really, um, prefer a fixed blade broadhead for a lot of reasons. One is also because there's, uh, well, Idaho specifically does not allow mechanical broadheads for elk or for hunting. So I just like to keep one set up throughout the year. I will say though, I, um, was just on a recent mule deer hunt. And I've been testing out what are these, the mega meat expandables. I've never been an expandable guy, but I figured, hey, I'm going to try it on a couple hunts this year. I probably wouldn't elk hunt with it though. They, yeah, expandables are great. They fly great. I just wish that they had the, the power of a standard fixed blade. And this is just such a solid tip. I mean, I could pretty much shoot a cinder block with it and everything will survive. So that's what I like. I, I don't know if you know James Nash, uh, a guide out out your way uh, for me in Kentucky, but he's a Western guide. And um, James and I did an entire episode on broadhead. So I just call that out here. We'll put a link to that in the show. But everything that Remy said, James expanded on for like an hour. It was one of our first episodes we did. Um, awesome episode for anybody that's looking to get into broadhead selection specifically. And he really broke down, to Remy's point, why you should go fixed for big game. So we'll put a link to that because I think it's really relevant to that question. All right, let's talk about the rest of your bow setup. What's your bow and your sight choice? Yeah, I mean, I've got a Prime Nexus here. This is their newer model. Um, I mean, it's actually pretty new, so I haven't done a lot of hunts with it. Um, but I mean, I, I like the Prime platform. Uh, my sight here, I've got the Fast Eddie XL. So I kind of, I was always a multi pin guy, and then I switched to this. I, I, I don't even know if it's not necessarily a single pin, but it's got a single pin. It's a single pin slider, but it also has a mark. For the second pin so it's actually got two pins on a single post and then over here on my dial it shows me the yardages Mm -hmm. for both those 
super, super handy because it kind of allows for that in the action when things move. I, I understand what those different yardages are for the different markings in there, but I can also be more precise and have a lot less going on in the site and just kind of focus through my shot process, level the bow, really have a clear sight picture. And I love the fact of kind of the single pin idea of just centering whatever I'm shooting at in the center of the site if I've got it set for my yardage. It's just, I think I found myself more accurate and a little more successful that way once I switched to this. There's a little getting used to, but um, I think that overall, I really enjoy that. Other accessories, uh, I use uh, drop away rest. I've been shooting these hamsky rests for quite a while now. This is the hybrid hunter. I really like it. It's, um, I can, I like to be able to micro tune my uh, rests. So that's huge for me because it really comes into getting a good tune on my bow, especially if you're going to choose to shoot fixed blade broadhead. So I want to be able to go from my field tips to a fixed blade. I want them to hit the same place. I want to be able to practice without tuning my target up but I need to make sure like I'll do some bare shaft tuning. I'll do some broadhead tuning. And that micro adjustment is key because I just need to move it sometimes just a, a just a fraction of a, yeah. just, I don't even know, like not even measurable distance, but sometimes that makes a big difference in actually getting it all squared away. And then, I mean, I, for a release, I just use, I mean, I don't even know what it is. I guess I've had it for 20 <laughs> years. Um, it's like a, it was maybe a Scott mongoose or something. It's got the little tether. It's, you know, it's definitely a Scott, but, um, wrist strap. I mean, this thing is pretty much the only one I've ever owned. It's pretty tattered, but I like it. It's been on lots of adventures, a little sentimental about it. I think a uh, good release is like a fine wine, just ages nicely. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of what I go. I know some guys try to stay away from that, but uh, I still shoot a wrist in the back tension style. And I've found a lot of success for hunting that way. Plus, I think the biggest key to bow hunting, one of the biggest secrets you'll ever hear is your, re your release should either be on your wrist or on your bow. It should never be anywhere else. Because as soon as you lose that, this whole setup's inoperable. And I've guided many guys or been on hunts where a guy sets his release somewhere and we get into the action and you don't have release. I did that once in my life and I've never made that mistake twice i i did it once i i have a one mile walk from my where i park to my stand and i got halfway there you know however whatever 5 a.m or whatever time it was walking out and i realized i didn't have it and i had to walk back lost all the time uh and forever i, I attach mine to the, my bow just like you did there i, I want to ask you about that site i've not seen a, a a single pin style site like that that has two pins so so when you tune it in you're essentially like how's that tape work when you put that on there does it have a uh, two pieces of tape that go on or do you just have to remember like the difference no it's got one i don't know if you can see it so it's got one piece of tape one site tape and then it's got two indicators so the top oh, okay. indicators for the top part of the pin so it's a single pin but it's got two fiber optics in it okay and then um and then the second one down is the marking for the second one and what i've also found is like essentially the distance between the top one and the bottom one the top of the bubble of the level is the same distance. So if I need to kind of figure out what my level is, I can actually set my top. So right now it's set it. If I have my bow set at 20 yards, my top pin at 20 yards, my second pin would be at 35. So essentially this, uh, the top pin has, there's two indicators on here. I don't know if you can see it or not, but the top indicator shows me where the top pin is and the other indicator shows me where the second fiber optic is. I've also noticed that the distance between those is about the top of the level as well. So I can essentially figure out three different ranges without moving the site if I had to. So if something happened, I would know what's going on. So right now, if I had it set at 20 top pin, um, the bottom pin would be about 36. When I'm walking around, I generally set it about 30 to 33 yards. So I make my top pins 30, my bottom pins 45, and I can essentially shoot out to 55 yards without moving or adjusting anything, just knowing where that arrow hits. And then um, from there, so it's really nice when I'm walking uh, sit like that, and if I got more time, I'll just micro adjust out to whatever yard, which is cool for a free shooting too, because I can crank it out to 100 yards or whatever. Back to practice, and super accurate. Yeah, that's really cool because I've ran into the challenge of. Um, you know, I've gotten busted. I have a single pin site, uh, similar setup and I've gotten busted adjusting it. You know, you, you have to, uh, if you're not exactly where it is, you got to adjust it. I've only got one option. So that's a pretty neat setup there. All right. You talked about the importance of being able to glass. What kind of, uh, binoculars are you using? 
Yeah, I mean, I've got, I think that if I was to spend money on any piece of hunting equipment for Western big game hunting, put your money in optics because honestly, uh, a good piece of binoculars is going to be your best chance at more success. And and you, you don't really think about it, but it's something that you're looking through all the time. If you can prevent eye strain, fatigue, and actually see more detail, you're going to spot more animals. I like, uh, these are the Raytech, or sorry, these are the Vortex Razor UHDs. It's just their top of the line glass, um, you know. And I also one other thing that I kind of like on my binoculars. I've got them on uh, I'm get from this one because they use a little bit higher magnification. So ten by forty twos or twelve by fifties are great for open country. And then this it's like a adapter for my tripod for my binoculars. So if I've got them that's really optics intensive, I can just lock those off on the tripod. You can see so much more, less eye fatigue, easier to glass for longer periods of time. So this is actually an outdoorsman post, um, and it has to grab it, but it's got another piece that it's on the tripod, so it's just easy on, easy off, super steady, super easy to use. I think that's pretty key in, as far as like Western bait hunting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, I use Vortex, um, but not, I don't use those particular ones, but I, I like mine as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about navigation. I know you have that watch that you said you, you've kind of been messing around with. I, I'm just out of curiosity more than anything. What's the watch you're using and how have you been playing around with the navigation on it? Yeah, so this is the Garmin. I guess it's the Delta Tactics. It's pretty awesome. So it's got AB ballistics on it. So you can actually, um, I've got like my dope charts for my rifle and everything on there. Uh, which is pretty handy. Like I came in pretty handy quite often this year. Or if I'm guiding a guy, I can actually use his bullet, his information. Yeah. Just have a story in there. Uh, it's got awesome maps and navigation on it. Maps and everything's pretty accurate. It, it's cool too to just track and see how far you go. Sometimes, like uh, two days ago when I was hunting, it was like I set it and I'm like, okay. And I was a little tired after the end of the day. It's like I get 3,500 feet elevation gain in 15 miles. And I'm like, oh, that explains it, you know? But it's cool to just track that stuff and be like, okay, I do what like, how far do you go? I was like, I have absolutely no clue. A few miles, you know, just right. like, whatever. You know, you don't really think about it throughout the day. Um, but that's cool. And, you know, in a new area or whatever, I can track back. And it actually has detailed total maps on the watch itself. Um, I would say the feature that I've used more than anything is the sunrise sunset. It's just yeah. programmed in there. So you hit the GPS, it gets your location, and then you know when sunrise is, when sunset is, because so much of planning your hunt is based on that. It's something yeah. that I'm always looking up. And so to just have it in my watch and you don't need service or anything, I mean, that's, it's the hidden feature. That's what really for me, that's like the selling point. I don't know why, but I just love that. No, man, I have mine. I'm sure it's not going to show up here, but on mine, I have on the, the watch face, I have a, uh, that's like one of the key features that I want all the time. So the watch face I use, it, it pulls it straight forward. Um, I don't know if you know this. Another cool fact about those watches, if you shoot with a Garmin Zero bow sight, then um, they will, that, that, watch can sync up to tell you where the arrow landed because it knows how far you shot. So if you're shooting across a drainage or, you're, you know, in hunting, sometimes you're looking at a field of grass and it all looks the same, but it can tell you exactly where to start your blood trail. Fun fact for people right there. <laughs> yeah, I, I did notice that. I've actually been messing around with that site a little bit. Uh, I can't use it everywhere, but I've, uh, yeah, I have seen that. It's pretty cool. There's, yeah. there's a lot of there's more features on it than I really know how to use, but I've been enjoying just kind of like messing around with it. Yeah, I, I was never a watch guy either. And then I've like, since I got this, I don't think I've taken it off. It's crazy. Like, I really, probably one of my most surprising, awesome pieces of gear. Yeah, I was kind of the same way. I didn't think I would like a smart. Well, this is my first smart watch I've had, but there's so many awesome features about it. And the battery life on those things is crazy if you're not using GPS. I mean, I the problem with it is you actually forget to charge it because it'll go two weeks if you're not using GPS. Or I don't know about that one, but mine will go about two weeks without you know, if I'm not running or, or hiking or hunting or something with it. Yeah, I think without, um, I'm going to look right here. I think it has, I mean, I think I've gone a month or two um, without charging it. Nice. Right now, I, I use the GPS almost every day. It's got 13 days left. Okay, last that's, that's probably a It also has a, a little bit of a solar charging capability. Oh, so. uh, okay. That's what you got going for you. Mine doesn't have the solar ability, so that's really cool. Um Fun fact too, uh, also just throwing it out here for anybody that's listening. If you have a Garmin watch you, uh, on those hikes, those days that you, you were talking about, like all the elevation, um, on the Go Wild app, you can import that Garmin activity and it'll scroll through and sync up your heart rate 
uh, and show it uh, what it was at that second of the elevation climb. And you can actually feel your heart rate pulsating um, through the phone, like through the phone's haptics. It'll recreate what your heart rate was. So when it's at like 190, you're like, the phone's just shaking. You're like, oh my God, how did I not die? <laughs> uh, all right, last thing, man, I wanted to ask you, I, I think we covered everything you had had uh, got out and that I kind of prepped you for. What is, you know, you hunt a ton of different animals. You're into bird hunting. We talked about turkeys on our other show. You're into elk, all kinds of Western big game, mule deer. Um, across all that stuff, is there anything that, like, is your must-have on all your hunts? Um, I mean, one the must-have piece of gear, it has to be optics, really, good pair of binoculars. Um, I really, I really can't imagine. Like, if I walked out without a good pair of binoculars, pair of binoculars I just feel naked. Like, <laughs> it's like, okay, I know I'm not getting anything today, you know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like you forgot pants. All right, man. Um, hey, tell people really quick where they can find you to follow you on social media. Yeah, you can find me on Instagram, at Remy Warren. Also on other social platforms, at Remy Warren is pretty much the way to find me. So start there and figure out the rest. And I know you have a YouTube channel. We'll link to that in the show notes. Um, all the gear is going to be linked to in the show notes, everything that Remy talked about. So if you're interested in checking any of this stuff out, Remy, thank you so much, man, for coming on and, and giving a little insight into your elk hunting setup. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, thanks y'all for tuning in this week. I hope you enjoyed that show with Remy. I always enjoy time getting to talk to Remy Warren. I always learn a little bit of something. And again, the dude is just so impressive. His background is so impressive. I, I don't know many people that spend that much time in the woods. It's like 300 days a year or something. It is insane. All right, again, all the gear that Remy talked about is linked to in the show notes. If you buy something from those links, we probably make money. If Go Wild makes money, we're definitely going to donate a portion of our proceeds into Raise Them Outdoors. What is Raise Them Outdoors? I'm so glad you asked. Raise Them Outdoors is a camp, the nonprofit for kids. It teaches them and their parents to hike shoot, camp, fish, all that good stuff. All the things you love about the outdoors. Aaron and her team teaches the kids to do that. So again, we're going to donate a portion. Don't forget to, to buy through the links if you do to support the show, to support Raising My Outdoors. Please, as you come into elk season this year, I want to see your elk story. So make sure you're posting those stories on Go Wild. Tag me. Uh, tell me what you learned from this episode with Remy Warren. You can log the show. Hit the plus sign. Hit the outdoor podcast. You'll find Gearbox Talk right there. We love hearing those that content. We're going to put a nice little suite of links up here in the show so you can find some other things to watch that are directly related to the show you just finished watching as well. All right, that's it for me today. I'm out.